So just here beside me, you can see a memorial to Jewish victims of part of the Holocaust that occurred here in Budapest in Hungary. Uh, the Arrow Cross militiamen, they lined up Jews here, ordered them to take off their shoes and then shot them into the river Danube. Arrow Cross was a fascist group here in Hungary during the Second World War. And this is a very um, solemn and poignant place to start today's video, which is does Ukraine or Russia need denazification by Ekele? Sar experience. So greetings on a very blustery and a little bit chilly day. Got my winter parka back on again from Budapest in Hungary, where I relocated due to the war in Ukraine. It's day 37 of the war when I'm filming this video. And that um, memorial was actually cited by Ukrainian President Zelensky in a speech he gave to the Council of the European Union. Uh, it's probably about a week ago at this stage when he was calling out the Hungarian pre uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban uh, for not doing enough, in Zelensky's opinion, to support Ukraine. And long before this war started, and in President Putin, the Russian president's declaration of war speech that he gave two days before he started this new invasion of Ukraine, he cited a, that Ukraine needs to be denazified. And to kind of send up, he claims that the U current Ukrainian government, the country is dominated and controlled by neo-Nazis, by the Nazis. And is there any truth in that? That's what we're going to look at. And then afterwards, we're going to examine how Russia itself is governed today and look at whether it also needs a little bit of denazification. So first of all, these terms, Nazi, fascist, Nazalist, pretty hard to really define nowadays because people give them so many different meanings. They throw these terms out as insults. And I watch both sides propaganda every day during the war and especially on the pro-Russian side. They've now started to substitute the word Nazi a lot with nationalist, which is very strange to me because, well, by invading Ukraine, it's clearly a nationalist uh, imperialistic war, basically, by Russia. So I don't understand why that's suddenly become also a pejorative term for them to use. But we'll just kind of give it an umbrella term, the far right, in that sense, uh, to describe both countries and their situations. So let's get into it and start with Ukraine. Now, the first thing is, which is kind of interesting for me as a former lawyer, both Nazi, fascist, and actually communist symbols are illegal <laughs> in Ukraine. They're actually banned. So in theory, there shouldn't be any Nazi party, fascist party, communist party in the country at all. And of course, you know, you can have a similar party and just avoid those direct symbols or, or names in your party, names you instead of calling yourself the Ukrainian fascist party or Nazi party. Of course, you can name it something else and then have exactly the same uh, political ideology. Um, so I think in Ukraine, whilst they do have this law, and this law, by the way, is definitely enforced more uh, against communist symbols and Soviet symbols uh, simply because, well, they had, obviously, the Soviet Union. Uh, Ukraine is part of the Soviet Union, and during that period, they obviously had a lot of Soviet symbols, a lot of Soviet statues and Soviet um, uh, buildings, uh, leadership. So there's a lot of history. The street names, that's one of the big things that's been changed recently, was they didn't have so many Nazi or fascist names of different places or their symbols about because, well, Soviet Union was on the winning side of the Second World War. So all those vestiges that would have been put up uh, in the, during the war were obviously destroyed afterwards. So um, that's the first thing is the legal situation, which is that, well, Ukraine, it's actually illegal to have a Nazi or fascist party. So two groups that Russian propaganda has focused on um, during this war and before it are the Azov Battalion, or Azov Regiment, and Bandera, Stepan Bandera. So let's get into those two and see if there's any truth about whether they are Nazi or not. So Azov Battalion was founded by Andrei Beletsky, and he is a figure that has been associated with the far right in Ukraine for a long number of years and has made statements that suggest that he holds uh, views that are definitely pretty close to being neo-Nazi. So he founded this uh, group and then 
at the beginning of the war in Donbass in 2014. He and the other House of Battalion members, they went down to Mariupol and they fought there rather successfully. They managed to take back the city from, from Russian forces or pro-Russian forces. And basically the Russian propagandists are focused on them and these neo-Nazis in inverted commas who were obviously uh, had one in that particular city. Now, the Azov Battalion itself has a symbol which is a bit reminiscent of a Wolf's angle, right, a Nazi symbol, and also they have a cross thing that also looks a little bit Nazi. And I have to say that when I was in Ukraine in 2014, I saw the Azov Battalion organizing, and they were, it was actually in the city of Poltava, which is in between Kiev and Kharkiv. And I saw them on the street at the time. I didn't know anything about them. I saw their symbols and I saw the way they were standing on the street. They were very militaristic. And I thought, wow, that looks like a, a neo-fascist group. So definitely they give that impression for, uh, at their inception uh, that they were a far right group for sure. Now, since then, they have expanded and they do not have in their official philosophy anything that is neo-Nazi or, or fascist per se, and you have seen some investigations into them, and there are claims that maybe 10 to 20 percent of Azov are, do in fact hold Nazi views or far-right views, and that shouldn't be so much of a surprise for a battalion that was involved in uh, defending Ukraine when it was first invaded in 2014 by Russia, uh, that the people were most fanatic who were organized, because at the time, the Ukrainian military was not organized at all to repel uh, the annexation of Crimea and then the war starting in Donbass, which is in two oblasts in the east of Ukraine, Luhansk and Donetsk. So these guys were more mo motivated, more fanatical. Uh, that kind of coincides with many of them having extreme far-right views. So nowadays, they've been incorporated uh, into the Ukrainian military, and they've been still down in Mariupol, which on day 37 has not fallen yet to uh, the Russian troops. Uh, there's been a battle going on there since the very first day. It was war basically started in Mariupol with the bombing of 4 a.m. on February 24th. And basically it's developed in the meantime into more kind of an elite Ukrainian uh, regiment in the army than necessarily political movement that is, you know, that incorporates the far right. So it's very hard today to say whether they're just more patriotic Ukrainians who want to be in it, serve in an elite regiment, or if in fact, they're just a bunch of neo-Nazis. Now, if you watch pro-Russian propaganda, they're gonna tell you every single Ukrainian soldier almost, because I watch their telegram channels and their media, and they basically show photos of dead Ukrainians, say Nazi, 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 Nazi. There's no evidence that they're ever showing uh, directly that any of these people hold Nazi views, just seems to become a big slur. But definitely there is an origin uh, being closely associated with some um, leaders who did hold or do hold um, Nazi views, that's clear. So it's a little bit ambiguous. And at the end of the day, there's about 1,000 uh, people in the Azov regiment, and that's a small part of the Ukrainian army. It's, probably, it's less than 1%. And politically, the far right in Ukraine gets very little in the way of support politically. If you look at the 2019 elections, they got around 2% of the vote. Uh, and that's actually pretty low by European standards. If you look at other parties that are similarly extreme in their ideology, um, they actually get a lot more in, in other countries, including here actually in, in Hungary, you could say. So um, not very convincing that that part is actually neo-Nazi although definitely there are some people who are in Azov. And yeah, anyways, at the moment, they are still fighting the Russian forces in Mariupol. So the second figure that is associated with neo-Nazism by the Russian side in Ukraine is Stepan Bandera and people who support, I guess, the ideology or the memory of Stepan Bandera. Now, so he was a very controversial figure from the Second World War. He was part of several insurgent groups, Ukrainian insurgent groups that fought for Ukrainian independence at the time, and they allied themselves at the beginning of World War II with Nazi Germany. 
And then, well, they kind of then became these opportunists that kept switching sides and in fact went on to fight against the Nazis, also then later on fought against the Soviet Union. And in the midst of that, uh, their insurgent groups murdered large numbers of Polish, Jewish, and also Russian civilians. So definitely if you look at the ideology of Stepan Bandera, it seems to me clearly from the far right, and they were involved in uh, massacres of civilians in the Second World War. So definitely someone who is, qu it's questionable whether someone like that should be venerated in modern Ukraine or not. And there has been a movement in the last, say, 20 years to re-establish him as a figure uh, in Ukraine, and many streets are named after him. And his flag, and the flag of uh, UPA, which is red and black, is more and more common. And you will see it more and more the further west you tend to go in Ukraine, where they were based. So whilst during this war, I haven't heard so much about Stepan Bandera and the Benderites, as they're called. That was more something heard in the previous uh, eight years since this, this war began in 2014. Definitely, he is a very questionable figure. He was actually assassinated by the KGB in Munich where he fled after the Second World War. And there are, you know, it's quite common to see that red and black flag and to see, you know, his name or his picture uh, at certain events from certain groups that are closer, that are more nationalistic in Ukraine. Whether that means that, you know, his ideology is embraced by everybody who flies that flag, that's you know, or is it just a nationalist representation of being Ukrainian? That's a bit unclear at times. But as I said, 2% of the Ukrainian population uh, vote for the far right in general, all of them together. So definitely another controversial figure, a bit like Azov, uh, whether they should be venerated because of their ideology and their past. Uh, the reality is Ukraine has a somewhat dysfunctional liberal democracy and 73% in 2019 voted for Vladimir Zelensky um, to become president of Ukraine, who is number one, Jewish, number two, Russian speaking, uh, number three, his grandfather, if I'm not mistaken, fought in the Red Army in the Second World War, and number four, many of his family members, his ancestors died in the Holocaust. They were murdered uh, by the Nazi forces uh, during the Second World War. So if 73% of the population are willing to vote for him, it doesn't indicate that Ukraine has a massive Nazi problem. Now remember that Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, claimed that the government that Ukraine is led, basically tried to claim they're basically been controlled or taken over by Nazis. And he in particular was trying to get rid of Zelensky as president at the beginning of the war at least, so that seems to have changed a bit uh, in the last week, because we're on day 37 when I'm filming this. Now it seems to be focusing on the denazification of Mariupol because Azov are based there. But anyways, back at the beginning of the war, he was trying to claim, and you saw a lot of propaganda saying that basically they're gonna denazify Ukraine but get rid of, rid of Zelensky. And it is pretty implausible that the current Ukrainian government is a Nazi government. That just sound, looks ridiculous on the face of it. Are there elements within Ukrainian society that embrace ideologies that are similar, that are from the far right? Definitely. But ultimately, they get 2% of the vote. And so the country is not controlled by Nazis. That, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. And finally, definitely nationalism and Ukrainian identity has been on the rise since 2014 when Russia invaded Ukraine, invaded annexed, uh, Crimea, and then started the war in Donbass. And that is to be expected because obviously if you have an external aggressor that attacks a country, and now we've got this full, full blown invasion of Ukraine by Russia, then it's gonna make the people feel uh, because they're all together being attacked as more one people being Ukrainian. and. Uh, make them more nationalistic in general because they're seeing these absolutely barbaric scenes on a daily basis in the country. So that's not a big surprise. I guess it would be the same in most countries in the world. I mean, also I grew up in Ireland where, you know, part of the national identity was always in contrast to this external aggressor, meaning England or later on the United Kingdom. So this is pretty much a normal reaction. But in conclusion, does Ukraine need to be denazified? I'm very skeptical that by changing the government, you're going to denazify it 
just doesn't add up. Я просто почувствовал, что мне надо э, объявить, что я не признаю этого гражданства. Я не признаю гражданство России, которое правит фашист Путин. So, turning our attention to Vladimir Putin's Russia. Now, Putin has been in power for 22 years. И Russia, regrettably today, is definitely no longer a liberal democracy, unlike Ukraine. It is a revanchist autocracy. Uh, it was pretty clear in Putin's declaration of war speech that he made two days before this invasion started that he doesn't consider Ukraine to be legitimate as a country and entitled to be independent of Russia and also its borders are basically up for grabs and he thinks it's his mission to denazify it, i.e. change the government and grab parts of it as he started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the beginning of the war in Donbass. So many analogies are made between Hitler and Putin for this autocratic revanchism. Now that's doesn't mean that just Putin, or sorry, doesn't mean that just Hitler used, has done this in the past. Many uh, countries' leaders have, you know, justified attacking their neighbors because of revanchism, i.e. they want to take back territories they claim are legitimately theirs or historically theirs. Uh, but definitely there are a lot of parallels between uh, what Russia is doing by going westwards and what Adolf Hitler did in the 1930s and 40s by going eastwards, uh, where he claimed definitely at the beginning of World War II or just before it uh, with his invasions of Czechoslovakia in particular Sudetenland that he was just uniting German people and part of that foreign policy that he had Adolf Hitler was Heim ins Reich at home in the Reich in the Empire and he held a series of referenda in order to legitimize that and incorporating those parts into the German Reich and we've seen that in 2014 in Crimea after Russia seized it and also in Donbass where they've been holding referenda uh, first declaring independence and now their leaders are suggesting that they're going to hold more referenda to try and say that it's part of Russia already and also South Ossetia which is a separatist region Georgia their leader announced that he was going to was considering to do the same thing so that looks like a very similar policy in that regard. Now also you have symbolism since this new invasion uh, started on February 24th the letter Z or Z has because Zoro has become a big symbol in Russian propaganda uh, to unite the Russian public around the war. There's a lot of controversy about what the Z is supposed to mean. It's been painted on the equipment, the vehicles that we used especially in the south coming out of Crimea. It could mean Za uh, Zapobedu, which means to victory, it can mean lots of things, but basically have this symbol. It's also got the St. George colors, light brown and a, a black, kind of almost black color. And that has been turned into what some people, detractors of Russia, call a new swastika, swastika with a big Z. So you have a symbol uh, that definitely, you know, unite people around this invasion, very militaristic, and that has been used in a lot of propaganda, especially from the beginning of the war. Very catchy videos that seem to be targeted at young people in particular, kind of like a Hitler Jugend uh, vibe of videos saying we don't leave our people behind. Uh, again, Heim ins Reich uh, message and basically trying to rally people around this invasion in Russia using that kind of symbolism. And furthermore, on March 18th, uh, Putin organized a mass rally of support for his, his war. It was on the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea, if I'm not mistaken. And basically that had a little bit of the, again, vibe of a Nuremberg rally by the Nazis and Adolf Hitler from the 1930s, trying to kind of rally people, not just around the leader, but kind of merging the idea of the leader and the state as being one to criticize the government is to criticize the country and be unpatriotic. And you see this in a lot of countries, especially when there's a war. This doesn't make Russia an exception to do that. And Putin's been in power already for 22 years and he's basically changed the constitution so he can stay on. Let's be frank, he's going to stay on indefinitely. Uh, it looks like because he can stay on already for more than another 10 years. So, and the guy is, I think, almost 70. So he's probably sees himself more as a, a leader for life. And also with his speeches from before, uh, from before the war, especially when he was referencing history all the time, he seems to be projecting himself as a new czar. 
uh, in Russia. So, you know, again, Deutsches Reich, the, the Third Reich, and then you have this more imperialistic uh, message rallying around the leader, merging them into one complete crackdown on any sort of independent media. It's basically been eliminated in Russia. You see this kind of inexorable slide, very slow slide over the years from, in Russia toward, from authoritarianism to totalitarianism. Uh, again, something that's reminiscent, reminiscent of what happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, definitely, Russia, it looks more and more like a proto like a proto fascist state because of that uh, opposition groups. There is still some opposition groups in the parliament. Some of those are the Communist Party. Also, there's a far right party that also people can stand for election for. But anything to anything other than that, basically, that's significant has been banned. And there, you know, Navalny, who's the main, I guess, opposition figure in the country, has been in prison. Been accusations that. Uh, the Kremlin tried to poison them. So you're seeing all these measures against freedom of expression and freedom of speech. So much so that when I watch other YouTubers here uh, on the, this platform who are from Russia, who to me seem to be against the war, they say basically they are too scared to criticize the government. Even though their channels are in English and presumably their viewership is not in Russia, they shouldn't really be a high priority for the Russian government, but they're too scared to say anything because they're worried about what might happen to them, to their family members, they're unwilling to call it a war because that is a criminal offense in Russia to even call what's happening a war. So it's gone obviously to a ridiculous level in terms of trying to suppress any sort of criticism of the government. And definitely all of these, um, this phenom these phenomena are indicative of what you would see in fascist or a Nazi state. So these are all the hallmarks of it. And whilst there's been a big exodus since the start of war of especially younger Russians uh, who don't agree with the government trying to leave, there is kind of a, I saw described as a silent, aggressive majority that supports Putin. That's kind of, I feel like Russia has slept walked into this situation. And basically, I call them the, bab the Babushka Brigade. They basically just repeat everything they see on state television. Uh, Ukrainians are all Nazis, um, Russians would never kill civilians because of what they're told on television, and basically it's a just war to denazify Ukraine when they don't seem to be able to look at, at the state of their own country. And you know, look at the comparisons between, uh, say, Nazi Germany and modern Russia, and not just regurgitate what they've been told about all the Ukrainians being Nazis or led by Nazis, etc. Uh, and that is very disappointing. And I guess you saw the same thing to a large extent in, say, fascist Italy in the 30s and also in Nazi Germany, where, of course, there are people who are opponents of the regime, but a lot of people just went along with what was happening because it didn't really affect them so badly in the beginning. So Russia also has, it's kind of its own version, you could say, of the Azov Regiment or Battalion, which is the Wagner Group, which is a mercenary group that was find, founded by a guy who also has a history been associated with Nazism. And that guy's name is Dmitry Utkin. And it's called the Wagner Group, apparently, allegedly, because uh, Adolf Hitler's favorite composer was uh, Wagner and this leader who founded uh, Wagner Group allegedly he he's a big fan of both Hitler and Wagner so that's why it's got that name and they are a mercenary groups so are not integrated into the Russian military formally but they have been associated with the war in Donbass uh, going there also with the annexation of Crimea and now also being involved in this current invasion and they are a shadow group that have also alleged ties to neo-Nazism. Very hard to know, you know, to what extent, or if they're just guns for hire. They don't really have much of an ideology, but they have been associated with many war crimes in other parts of the world that they've been sent to, like in Syria and in Central Africa. So, you know, that's another group that you could say, well, needs to be denazified in inverted commas as well in Russia. So a big difference I do see between saying the ideology of Nazi Germany and the current Russian government is racism. There is not a formal racial element to the ideology. And that's normally something you see in the difference between say fascism and Nazism. So Putin doesn't see Ukrainians as unto mention uh, subunions who need to be uh, eliminated 
simply because they're Ukraine. In fact, he says the opposite. He says that it should that Ukraine uh, is with Russia and Belarus, a uh, triumvirate state, that they're just actually one people and that Ukrainians uh, are just like Russians, basically. At the end of the day, they're kind of brothers. You often hear this, that they're whole brothers together and that it is a historical mistake that they were ever separated. Now, whilst that means that he's not looking to exterminate all the Ukrainians based on their ethnicity, he's denying basically the right for them to be a separate ethnicity with their own country and be independent from Russia. So in order to achieve that, you definitely need to suppress the ability of Ukraine to act independently, have its own identity, uh, its own separate culture from Russia is going to operate independently. And that was going to require a lot of oppression, especially in the territory that Russia has seized. Uh, so you can maybe, maybe draw a comparison more with the Stalin era, NKVD, uh, and a lot of the war crimes that have been alleged in the last few weeks in Ukraine are pretty resembling of that abducting mayors of cities that don't uh, agree to cooperation with the Russian government, with the Russian occupation authorities, and, um, you know, abductions, killings. Um, so definitely uh, different to that. So I think that brings me in conclusion to looking at the Russian uh, behavior in this war and their justifications and the perverseness of what they're claiming. They're claiming basically to be denazifying Ukraine and also preventing a genocide of Russian-speaking Ukrainians while they're attacking cities like Mariupol, absolutely basically sacking the city almost, raising it to the ground, the numbers of civilians who are going to die. And these people are Russian-speaking. You know, it's insane. And there's an interesting quote from at the end of the Second World War from an Italian anti-fascist and his nom de guerre, his pseudonym that he uses, Ignacio Silone. And he predicted, predicted that the fascism of tomorrow will never say, I am fascism. It will say, I am anti-fascism. And that's the feeling I get with the current Russian invasion of Ukraine and their claims that they're denazifying Ukraine, is that perhaps they need to be looking closer to home in terms of the structure of Russia today and not looking at Ukraine as somewhere that they need to denazify. So that's my video. Let me know down in the comments what you think of the claims of Ukraine, first of all, needing to be denazified and is Vladimir Putin in fact Putler and closer in resemblance to Adolf Hitler and his war looking for Lebensraum, living room in Eastern Europe during the Second World War. And yeah, let me know down below. I will see you in the next video. Do pobacina, do svidanja. Ciao, ciao from beautiful Budapest and also very poignant and tragic Budapest where I started this video and the memorial to Hungarian Jews who were murdered here by the banks of the river Danube by the Hungarian fascists during the Second World War. Ciao, ciao. Sar experience.